This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants me. You're gonna acknowledge me. Welcome to the WWE podcast for this Monday Night Raw review on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. We're going to talk Monday Night Raw, a, a Monday Night Raw that just keeps rolling, right? It, it's it got such a nice feel to it. And yes, there are things that are just silly and, and continue to plague WWE. But, you know, in this post Vince McMahon era, Triple H has shown that he can steer the ship and steer it in a way that feels fresh and continues to feel fresh as uh, we've all been under the, the guidance of Vince McMahon for the last how many years, right? At least most of our lives, everyone listening to this, I bet every wrestling event that you've seen in WWE, most of us, are probably under the creative of Vince McMahon. And now we get to see what another brain or two <clears throat> with um, Stephanie, of course, at, the, at the, the CEO level, what we can do and what they can do. Another very wrestling-heavy show for a wrestling show isn't that amazing when you can get a lot of wrestling quality matches long matches on a show that is you know wrestling because of world wrestling entertainment i think they forgot about that second w for a long long time and you know it it is a different taste you know you have to kind of settle in with the longer matches it's not uh, the norm that we've re- that we're used to until Triple H took over, but I think it's something that is that is a nice change. Every match doesn't need to be forty five minutes. I agree, you can have short matches, but when Triple H knows he has quality wrestlers in the ring, he's going to allow them to flesh out a story in the ring and not rely on the entertainmenty stuff of the 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 promos that can get silly. The convoluted storylines, everything that got the kind of the the bells and whistles that were in excess don't need to be there all the time. And you can just tell a great story with pro wrestling. So um, but that said, let's get into the specifics of Monday Night Raw here. Uh, Actually, before we do, I want to let you guys know, no, not not plugging my Patreon, but uh, we have a new host coming on to cover AEW Dynamite and Rampage and any of pay-per-views that they do. And his name is Travis. He will be joining us. Actually, he has his own podcast. And funnily enough, um, when when he reached out, interested in the position, um, he is super local to me. Like, I mean, I could drive to his studio in like probably 15 minutes. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, just how, uh, how close we were. And, and, um, so Travis Hughes, uh, that's his name. He will be joining us as the AEW host starting next week. Not this week. Uh, so this will be your final week without an AEW review. And starting next week, Travis will be joining us to cover everything AEW. I really think you guys are going to enjoy him. Previous podcast. So he's still got his own podcast. I'm sure he'll let you guys know about that as well. But I'm uh, really excited to be able to bring him on and talk AEW uh, uh, really a subject that has been gone since Mimi left. Damn you, Mimi. Damn you. <laughs> no, but thank you for all your contributions. But as we turn a page here to the new chapter of Travis, I'm looking forward to it. And I think you guys will enjoy it. All right. Again, that's next Thursday. So let's get into Monday Night Raw, the specifics here. And I, I think another theme that has been just consistent since Triple H took over, one that I don't think a lot of us are used to that I have pointed out since he took the helm is anger, anger, heel heat, something that I think has been underutilized over the last really many years is now back. What do I mean by that? Now, heel heat has always existed, but very rarely has WWE had the the balls to continue to build heel heat. And they always seem to cave to giving the fans what they want quicker than they should and forgetting the value of anger and fans and forgetting that you can build heel heat for quite some time before you make the payoff. 
And we've seen that with the, the Judgment Day. Very clearly, there's an example. Uh, we've also seen it with Damage Control, with Bailey, of course, Roman Reigns. Uh, and so it's something that I think Triple H is taking advantage of and realizing. Maybe he would, I, I shouldn't say he doesn't realize it. I'm sure he does. But I think a lot of fans have forgotten just the how useful anger can be in a pro wrestling setting. So, again, specifically, what do I mean by that? Once again, this week, the Judgment Day gets the, 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 the one up, right? They're, they're the ones standing tall. And they give another beat down. And they're going to celebrate and party or whatever they were doing. Dominic also had a, a nice little uh, monologue at the beginning with his group. Now, he wasn't out there solo. You know, he, he wasn't out there like flapping in the wind, but I think he did a nice job in being obnoxious and also back uh, backstage when uh, I think it was Sarah Schreiber who said, uh, you know, are you concerned for your father? You're going to go check on your father. And he said, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go check on my dad. And then he started cracking up as uh, you're just being just laughing at his father being injured uh, continues to drive home the point of, yes, Ray and Dominic will have a match, but it's going to be quite some time. But again, nice job as as uh, we see a little bit more development with with uh, Dominic Mysterio. He had a, a more comfortable night on the mic, and boy, did that heel heat! My God, you know, as I've just said, the the, the value of anger. How did you not appreciate that reaction that Dominic got? Just think about that. That is more of a reaction than he's gotten in one night in five minutes than all the reactions he's gotten put together since he came to WWE on the main roster. He is instantly more interesting. He is very unlikable. He's kind of this entitled punk kid that you want to punch in the mouth. Um, You know, he's joined a group that is inherently unlikable. Nobody's cheering them. It's great. It's all just well done. From top to bottom here, and Dominic turning heel, as I've said, and you have too. I've heard a lot of you say this for many, many months. Dominic needs to turn heel. He needs to turn heel. He needs to turn turn heel. I've been saying it for like a year and a half, and they teased it at one point a year and a half ago. During the pandemic era, they even teased it, and they didn't pull the trigger. They finally pull it, and instantly, just like that, Dominic becomes a, a big name. He does truly come out of the shadow of his father. That's not just symbolic or part of a promo. I think it actually happened. And he is, he, he's, he's not a household name, not, not even close, but he at least has established his own identity outside of just, eh, well, yeah, he's got the right last name and he can go in the ring. You know, he's actually got a, a, something to stand on, something to, to work towards, something to, that he can build his career out of. Um, and he won't be a heel forever. We know that. He'll eventually turn back babyface, and I'm sure that you know maybe he'll have one final tag team match with his his dad before his dad truly retires. I mean, you know, and, and of course Dominic will be the one to induct Ray into the Hall of Fame and all that. But before we get there, we've got a lot of fun in the meantime with Dominic as a heel, and uh, I love it. I lo- it just it's so great. It's so great, and um, you know uh, that's not what opened Raw though. What opened Raw was a great United States Championship matchup, like really good, better than I expected. And that is Bobby Lashley versus Seth Rollins for the United States Championship. And we all knew, I, I think that, uh, you know, if you've been watching wrestling, even for like a, f- a few months at this point, you probably knew that Dominic or rather uh, Seth Rollins was not going to win that United States Championship for so many reasons, so many reasons, right? He, it doesn't make sense for Seth Rollins at this point to win the United States Championship. It doesn't make sense because he's involved with Riddle, and it just it, it doesn't need the championship. It, it there's no real backstory between Lashley and Rollins at all. Um, so there's that, and then you also have the position on the show. Very rarely do titles change hands when it's not the main event of the show. Not not no no no. I don't I, not all the time, but generally speaking, when championships uh, change hands, it is for the main event of the show on Raw or SmackDown anyway, not pay-per-views. So you knew that also going in. And plus Riddle hanging out there. We all knew that Riddle was going to interfere, and it's exactly what happened. But it sounds like a it sounds like a, uh, a complaint. It's not because it's the right thing to do. 
You know, I, for so many so many years, you hear fans complain about predictability. It's too predictable. Oh, we saw that coming. Oh, that's so predictable. You know, and, and I've always said, well, yeah, predictability isn't fun because you know what's going to happen. And if you see ha- something happen that you thought was going to happen, it doesn't give you the surprise element. But would you rather have something that is <clears throat> predictable but the right thing to do or be surprised and it does long-term damage. I think I'd choose the former because something that is unpredictable and damaging will be fun in the moment, but they would regret it later on, right? It's, you could really use a lot of analogies with that in life, right? Like something simple, getting drunk. I love getting drunk. I think a lot of people listening to me might as well. Um, you know, if you have problems with alcohol, I'm not trying to trigger anybody, of course, but most of us that, you know, had a youth partook in the, the drink and, you know, I still enjoy whenever I can, which is like once every, you know, six months or a year for real. Now, whenever I get to drink, I, it's fun, right? Like it kind of brings you into a different world and there's just, there's just everything's so fun and right. Like it's kind of euphoria. And then, uh, the next day you pay for it. And you're like, oh, was that the right thing to do? You know, um, and so that's kind of my point is, I don't know, there's probably a better analogy, but drinking was the first thing that came to my mind. I think that's something that should, should I like, should I seek help? Um, but you guys get what I'm saying. I'd rather have something be predictable than something be fun in the moment. But then you look back and go, oh, that was, that was kind of dumb, you know? So, uh, like my whole point about this, how the hell did I get on to drinking from Seth Rollins and Lashley is that Riddle interfering here made total sense, made total sense given what Seth Rollins did to Riddle last week and stomping his head into the mat. Now Riddle costs Rollins the, uh, the United States championship and boy, that pedigree in the middle of nowhere was awesome. Like, I mean, I've never seen a more smooth transition from a spear into a pedigree in my life. Um, now, it wasn't a full-fledged, arms-hooked pedigree, but for all intents and purposes, it was about 80% of a pedigree and the best they possibly could have done. So that was, I mean, my I, I did not expect that good of a match from these two. Um, I don't know why I didn't, but I just, I don't know. It wasn't something I was like, oh my God, I can't wait. And we came away with that going, that was awesome. And it was easily the match of the night, um, you know, if, if people care about such things. And the uh, the live crowd in Anaheim, was it Anaheim? Where the hell were they? (laughs) Was it Anaheim? Or am I thinking that from last week? Good Lord. I'm trying to think of where they were this week. Um, I don't think it was Anaheim. Was it? Somebody out there is yelling. Anyway, um, but the crowd was really into this. And you know what they're also really into? They're really into Seth Rollins' theme song. Like, to the point of it could turn him babyface. To the point where it almost felt like, almost, up until Riddle got involved... That Rollins was the babyface in this match. Now Bobby didn't do anything heel, uh, heel uh, like he he didn't do anything to get the crowd angry. But Seth Rollins' entrance is more entertaining than Bobby Lashley's. I know that visually Bobby's is like he's the Almighty, he's on a pedestal, but it's not as fun because there's no participation with that. You just kind of sit and watch. With Seth, WWE inadvertently created a theme song for him that the fans sing along to, even though he's cast as a heel, but the very theme song that they created for him as a heel that he has done such a great job in may very well turn him babyface because it's so damn fun to sing along to Seth Rollins' music. If I was in attendance, I'd be singing along too. I've, I've got it in my head right now, right? You do too. Think about it. Whoa, whoa. I'm not going to do it for you but because uh, I'm awful at singing, but you guys know. It's a amazing. Uh, it's an amazing entrance music theme that gets stuck in your head. Like he's one of those entrance music themes that you're just walking, doing your day, doing your job day to day. You're sitting in your cube or you're sitting at home working or whatever, and it just pops in your head. It's just a. It's a genius song, whether it was intentional or not, and it has really gotten to the fans where they they don't hate Seth until Seth every week gives them a reason to try to to to, to hate him. Uh, because Seth hasn't held a championship for a while. He's taken so many big losses after big loss after big loss. And he's been, in a lot of fans' eyes, underutilized, which is crazy to think, for so long, months, if not years now. 
and now with Triple H in charge, obviously there's I think much more of an opportunity for Seth to uh, to reclaim that top 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 spot as champion and potentially beat Roman Reigns at uh, the uh, Survivor Series event, which is War Games, and I'll get into that later on about the War Games uh, matches, which I actually sadly had to Google. Like people have asked me, what do you think about the War Games? I'm like. Uh, first of all, I didn't know that. So I had to Google it. And then I read triple H's whole quote that he had on it and why he thinks it's a good idea and all that. But I've, since I never watched NXT, I didn't know what the hell a war games match was. Okay. We'll get into that. So I just, you know, completely discredited myself and my wrestling knowledge for a lot of you. (laughs) It's just the way it goes. Um, but anyway, Seth Rollins here and riddle continue their program Riddle and Seth get into a brawl backstage, and then uh, we had Riddle in the back challenge. Um, he challenged uh, he challenged Rollins to a, a pit match, like a fight pit match or something. Like, I, what the hell is that? Anybody else know? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. So I, I, they're doing all these stipulations. I've been watching wrestling for like thirty years. What the hell is that? Maybe I'm missing it. Is it in an octagon? Because Corey Graves alluded to Rollins accepting the challenge from from Riddle, but it was it was hinted that it's a octagon match or some kind of MMA style match. Like what? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm totally missing the point, and you guys need to educate me here. But uh, nonetheless, at Extreme Rules, Rollins and Riddle have their presumably final match. And you know, I'm sure it'll be good, if not great. There's, there's just it's impossible not to with these two. So, uh, all right. Well, let's continue on here. And who? What do we talk about? Let's talk about um, Kevin Owens and Theory, Austin Theory. And um, at this point, at this point, I'm excited for Austin Theory. And, and, and Owens, um, and because you know they're going to have a really good match. And it wasn't as good as Rollins and Lashley, but it certainly was something that you could hang your hat on for the night. And you can make an argument that this is the best match of the night. You could. Um, so this match was a, it was a fun, it was a fun match. And it, they went all over ringside and uh, Johnny Gargano ends up showing up to prevent Theory from using the Money in the Bank briefcase. He actually stole it from him. And it allowed Kevin Owens to hit the pop-up powerbomb for the win. So the pop-up powerbomb is now reestablished as a finish. It is not always the stunner. That's fun. And Kevin Owens is victorious here. And the interesting thing here is, as I alluded to last week, with the Johnny Gargano theory feud that's going on, but there's also theory and then Owens, I said, how, what are they going to do here? Like, how how are they going to make this a match? Theory and, or rather, Kevin Owens and uh, Johnny Gargano don't have any beef with one another. Like, so what are they going to do? And I said, maybe they do a triple threat. And I said, the only way they're going to do a triple threat is if the Money in the Bank briefcase is on the line. And then you saw this week, Johnny Gargano take the briefcase from Theory. So I don't know if that's foreshadowing the possible stipulation, if the triple threat happens, of the Money in the Bank briefcase being on the line. So I don't want to get too ahead of myself. And predict a match that, uh, or rather predict the outcome of a match that doesn't even exist yet. But I, I could foresee now, as they took a step in that direct general direction this week, of Kevin Owens versus Theory versus Johnny Gargano for the Money in the Bank briefcase. Somehow, maybe Johnny is able to convince or coerce or trick Theory into putting that briefcase on the line. I mean, who knows? But uh, either way, I mean, th- this is a this is a fun little trio thing going on here. A fun little... Uh, kind of side storyline with Johnny and Theory. So I'm interested to see where it ends. We also had the championship celebration for the women's tag team champions of Io Sky and Dakota Kai. Bailey on the microphone, uh, just as, as brilliant as always. And we had uh, we had Alexa Bliss and Bianca Belair come out and Asuka come out. And Alexa Bliss, who never, ever speaks... First of all, she had Lily again, which made me very sad. I mean, it just it just made me very, very sad that Lily uh, came back because I was hoping that we had finally seen the end of that nonsense. And uh, no, it's it's not to be the it's not to be the case here because we had uh, Alexa Bliss end up um, challenging 
Bailey to a matchup and they ended up having a decent match. And, you know, I don't know if this is also foreshadowing uh, Alexa bliss for some kind of character change. I don't, I don't know, but I would, I would welcome it. And I don't want her going back to the dark side of some version of the fiend version of her again. I I, I don't know. Maybe I want the, I, I don't know what I want. I, I want some kind of, some kind of transformation with Alexa or awakening of Alexa. Maybe that's a better word. I, I don't know if I want a total transformation uh, of just like completely turning what she is into something else, but maybe an awakening. It feels like she's asleep and I don't mean asleep as in her performances are terrible or she she's bad on the mic or it feels like she's half-assing it or phoning it in. I mean, her character has been asleep for way too long. She's been just put on the sidelines and backburnered for way too long. And I, I don't know the real reasons why. I mean, we, we saw her backstage essentially for two, the better part of two years with the playground and, and Lily and doing backstage silliness in the, the pandemic era didn't help things. But I think it's now time that they bring her into the forefront. She's too good of a talent. She's too good on the mic. She's too good. On, the camera loves her. Um, she feels confident. She's a solid perform wrestler. She, you know, she is, she's everything you'd want in a WWE uh, wrestler. I almost said performer. They got me on that performer g- uh, kick and I, I need to stop myself. So it's just, I don't know. Maybe this week was hinting at something with Alexa getting a little bit more mic time. I just didn't like that. Lily was there. I, I, I want Lily to go away. Um, now the, the one thing she, Alexa did say is that Lily, Lily may bite, but so she, she might also or something like, I mean, like, are you going to bite Dakota Kai or like, what, what? I don't know. It didn't make a ton of sense, but that's why I was thinking it may be hinting at something more for her. Maybe it's not. Maybe it was just like, Hey, Alexa hasn't got a lot of mic time. Let's just give her something to talk about. I don't know. But my, just my, my frustration has been long standing with the Alexa bliss character of man. Why aren't they using her? Is it injury? Is there something else? I don't know. Like, what is it? You know, Alexa could be women's champion. Alexa as a women's champion is believable. It's deserving. I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, I don't know. So I'm just perplexed, frustrated and waiting for an awakening of Alexa bliss. That's what I'm waiting for. I think that's the best way to put it with Alexa. So the match was good. Nothing crazy, but, uh, you know, Bailey and Alexa have some some history there. And Bailey alluded to that. And um, if you guys remember at Extreme Rules a number of years ago, Bailey couldn't muster up the guts to strike Alexa Bliss with the kendo stick. Do you remember that? I think that was that was a character killer. For Bailey at the time, but uh, so anyway, yeah, they have a decent match and Bailey gets the win, and yeah, so uh, I'm most interested here in the Alexa possible evolution into something. Uh, let's see what else. Miz and Champa came out for an episode of Miz TV. They talked about Dexter Loomis terrorizing him, and that led to Loomis. <laughs> I don't know why I'm. This is such a guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, this led to Loomis cutting his way through the ring with a huge knife. But the, the best part of that was is, is the visual of a knife being cut from underneath the ring. It was such a hilarious visual. Who Who's coming up with this stuff? I mean, it's great. Uh, and Dexter and Loomis just giving the, 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 the magical stare that he does and trying to drag Miz into the depths of hell uh, or and then trying to drag Champa into it and Dexter and Loomis then ended up just sinking back into the ring um, as Miz beforehand was screaming about nobody comes in my house and you know, it was my daughter's birthday and uh, you know, he, he was going on and on about a Minions party. And I'm like, when he was talking about the Minions party, I'm like, you said that you thought one of the Minions at your daughter's birthday party possibly had Dexter Loomis in it. I'm like, well... How big are these minions? Do you have people dressing up as minions? Is there something like, I don't know, when it's a minions theme party, there's just like little minions of like, you know, it goes on the cake. There's balloons of the minions. 
you know, napkins, plates, pinata, like what size of minions are at your party? Do you have adults wearing minion costumes that you could possibly think that Dexter Loomis is in one of them? It was, I don't know. And I know I'm digging super deep into the plot here and I'm not complaining at all. It's just something I'm like, what do you mean you thought Dexter Loomis was in one of the minions? Like, I don't know. Anyway, I'm I'm on board for this because Dexter Loomis is such a he's a, such an interesting character and somebody that you can get behind without him saying a word. And that's interesting to me because very rarely do you have a guy that looks the way that Dexter Loomis looks. As I've said, the best analogy I can think of is he looks like he just came out of boot camp and he got uh, well, I shouldn't say boot camp. Maybe he came out of war and he got an honorable discharge or something. And he's he's got the look of like seeing his best friend get killed in front of him. And that look hasn't left his face. It's just this blank stare. Um, I don't mean to be so morbid about it, but I think of like a military guy gone who who just went who just cracked or something. Uh, maybe he couldn't he couldn't handle boot camp or he saw something in war that was horrific. I, I don't know. Um, but that's what I think of. And that's a compliment because. That's not something you, you can't teach a look like that. You just have to kind of be genetically blessed to look like that half the time. I mean, you can do things to mess with your hair and your eyes and all that. You can learn how to give facials, but Dexter Lumis doesn't do anything other than just stare off into the abyss. And it, it's it's so funny. And, and seeing him st- in random places, having his face pop up is it, it's great. Um, yeah, I'm surprised somebody hasn't already made the meme of Dexter Lumis as uh, it with uh, the the original it with Georgie when the the boat goes into the sewer and imagine Dexter Loomis's face coming up instead of the clown with it coming up and and peeking through the sewer. If it's like Dexter Loomis, right? Like how has somebody not made that yet? It's right there. It's right there. If I had the creative skill from a, a, you know, Photoshop standpoint or, or otherwise, I mean, that, that, that's a that's a meme that's ready and willing, especially with Halloween around the corner. Dexter Loomis, somebody please out there do this. Can you please put uh, Dexter Loomis's face underneath the sewer with like the Miz walking by or something on the street instead of Georgie? I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I'm thinking about this right now, but there's a lot you can do with Dexter Loomis with that look. There's You could crop him into so many different places. You can make hilarious videos out of it. Yeah, but anyway, let's move on. Um, what do we have here? Uh, we've got again, the, the, the absolute nuclear heat on, um, on Dominic Mysterio was just amazing. Ripley calling herself mommy is creepy and it kind of borders on just like what's happening here, but it's, it's fine with me. Um, that was good. Dominic also daring his dad to hit him with a chair was fun because it again solidified where Ray stands right now that he's not going to strike his son. That was that's uh, also very important as we move on in time here. Uh, let's see. The Brawling Brutes took on the Street Profits. So Ridge Holland and Butch came out to give a promo about their plans to win the tag titles, but they were interrupted by Montez and Angelo. And they threw some insults back and forth. And then uh, they ended up in a team, a tag team match. And uh, Holland and Butch scored a clean win to give them some momentum heading into their title shot against the Usos. I mean, you know that if somebody has a title match coming up and the other person, the other person or team has nothing coming up, that the person with the title match coming up is going to win the match 99.9% of the time. So in this case, it made sense. You want to see Ridge and Butch look as strong and dominant as possible. So it, it gives the illusion of the actual, an actual threat to the Usos championship. Uh, they're going to have that match this week on uh, SmackDown. And there's a nearly 0% chance. I'd say like a 1% chance, maybe 2% that the brawling brutes defeat the Usos. It's just doesn't make sense. I still believe it's going to be Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Um, whenever they eventually team up and I, you know, I don't want to get into that, but I think eventually that will happen. That's my guess. But, uh, yeah, so the match was fine. It, you know, again, there was no, there were no bad matches on the show. Very rarely are there bad matches on raw. And, uh, you know, this was fine. 
this was good, you know. Um, and Angela Dawkins, I have to say, I'm not a big proponent of him from a character standpoint, but in ring, he is clearly trying to keep up with the Joneses. And I mean that complimentary, complimentarily because he knows that Montez is a star of that, that tag team. And he knows that Montez outdoes him athletically, you know, hand over foot. He just does. But Angelo is doing everything he can with the size he is to keep up with the athleticism of Angelo or uh, with, with, um, with uh, Montez. So I give him props. Like, you know, Angelo Dawkins is much improved and I don't think it's talked about enough with Angelo Dawkins doing the things he does for the size he is. Um, now the, the other side of the coin is if he's that size, should he be doing those things? You know, like, I don't know. You can make an argument that a lot of people who are bigger feel the need to wrestle like they're smaller instead of wrestling to the size they are. Meaning, I don't need to see flip-flops, flies, kip-ups, you know, uh, suicide dives, all that kind of crap like Big E used to do and uh, all that stuff. I just, some, I I see both sides of it. There's an argument to be made on both sides. I don't think anyone's right or wrong. But to me, if I was to make a decision, I would say wrestle the size you are because otherwise everyone feels and looks the same. Somebody that's a bigger guy wrestles like somebody that's smaller. It blends everyone together. And it's this kind of just mush of gray area. Like no one's distinct from another person because everyone wrestles the same. They have the same move sets. So that's my thought. Also, bigger guys typically wrestle slower. I like slower matches. But uh, the other thing, maybe we can do away with beyond super kicks overused and all that stuff, which is so overused, is... um, the spot where everyone is somehow collected outside the ring and just like in some kind of, I don't know, mosh pit. And there's always somebody that dives over the top rope and like does some kind of somersault on them or some kind of splash on them. And everyone has to collapse. Even if you're not a part of it, if you're anywhere in the vicinity, you must hit the ground. How many times have you seen this spot over the last month? That's one small criticism I'd have to make. That spot is so overused where everyone is just conveniently grouped together. No one sees this person coming and everyone falls. Even the people on the fringes. I'm just not a fan of that. You'll notice like some people aren't even like no one's even touching them, but because they're just in the vicinity, they will fall too. It's weird and it's overused. So you guys, you like, you like some negativity. There it is. I got to satisfy my negative people out there. All right, let's see here. What else happened? Um, uh, Judgment Day versus Matt Riddle and Rey Mysterio happened. Again, I I talked about this with Finn Balor and Damian Priest winning. Balor got the pin on uh, Papa Mysterio uh, with the coup de grace, and the match was good. There was a lot of interference. Really, there was a lot of interference on a lot of these matches tonight, but... Uh, you know, it's pro wrestling. It, I think it was a little overused for Monday Night Raw, but the the outcomes made sense, so I give it a pass. And this is this made sense. Finn Balor and Damian Priest win, continuing to build the heat. The Judgment Day haven't gotten theirs yet. Uh, now, there's a new element to this, and it's AJ Styles. Finn Balor and AJ Styles went face to face backstage. When I saw AJ, I'm like, whoa, dude, where you been? It felt so good to see AJ Styles. Um, felt so good. When I saw him, I'm like, yeah, dude, let's go, right? Like, it just felt like I, I found a lost friend. And Finn Balor confronted him, and you know, they, they, he tried to pretend that there's no hard feelings, and it's, hey, it's me, man, it's still Finn. And AJ said, you know, I haven't seen you, or I haven't talked to you because you joined the Judgment Day, and I want no part of it. And, and Finn said, uh, you're looking for a fight, and AJ, you know, didn't really respond to him. And so it looks like at some point this will break down very quickly into a uh, AJ Styles, Finn Balor mini program going on with the all the other things going on with, you know, Edge and Ray and, and uh, all the like. So I think the Judgment Day is going to be quickly outnumbered or at least the odds will be even very soon as you have Edge who will be coming back. You'd imagine, and you know, at Extreme Rules or shortly thereafter, and you have uh, now AJ Styles getting in the mix. You know he's going to now get involved. You have Rey Mysterio countering the Judgment Day. 
So there is going to be a lot of fun to be had here. And also Riddle, of course, but Riddle is just a stand in because he's really just in, he's really involved with the Rey Mysterio or rather the uh, Seth Rollins program, not necessarily with the Judgment Day. But this is fun. This is this is a nice little a group that has been resurrected literally from the dead after Edge was ousted. You know, I was I, I really pretty much gave a eulogy for the Judgment Day after Edge left and Judgment Day wasn't on TV for like a month. And we were all just scratching our heads. Why the hell is Edge gone from the group? And, uh, you know, Triple H and Creative have done a nice job resurrecting him, uh, Dominic, and the whole Judgment Day storyline in, in a way that I didn't think was possible. And that's, you know, that's a compliment to everyone involved in WWE because it was on life support, if not already, uh, you know, coded, right? It coded. And <laughs> they brought it back from the dead somehow. So uh, good job there. Um, what else happened here? I feel like there's something else. We'll get to war games in a minute. Uh, let's see. Bel Air. Oh, Bel Air was beat down by Bailey as Bailey uh, beat Alexa. And then Oscar tried to help and she got beat down. And then ba- Bianca Bel Air uh, got in the ring and she got a couple shots in, but eventually succumbed to the numbers game and she got beat down. And uh, that's where Bailey said she's in control and all this stuff and then challenged uh, challenged Bianca to a match at Extreme Rules for the Raw Women's Championship. So finally, the match happens. I think it's probably one of three that are uh, going to happen in a row. That's my guess because this is a this is a money match. Like Bailey versus Bianca is a money matchup. You don't just do it once and leave it. So uh, I would imagine this is a series, unless they do it once and then pause and do it again at WrestleMania. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll, in the next six months, you're going to see a lot of Bailey Bianca, and that's fine. I think you're going to get really good matches out of these uh, two women. So. Um, what else happened here? We got, I feel like there was something else. Maybe not. Um, so yeah, that pretty much covered it. I do want to talk about war games here because, uh, that's what survivor series is being billed as. And it's, it's crazy. Like right now we have extreme rules coming up. Extreme rules feels like it's an afterthought because they're already building to the November 5th event in Saudi Arabia crown jewel. And then they talked about Survivor Series being billed as war games. And, um, you know, I had to look up what a war games match was. And they have the men and women here. And, you know, Triple H is the one who is heading that up. I think that you know, th- this is something that I think could work. I think that it's, it's, it's a little risky here because a lot of people probably don't know what the hell war games is. And here, here's what uh, Triple H said about War Games. He announced the, uh, this is on, where am I going to give credit where credit to? Give Me Sport. Give Me Sport is a, I've never heard of them. But this is a, I mean, it's confirmed. But uh, it was from The Ringer. That's where it was originally was announced by Triple H. It's going to take place on November 26th. They said that there will be two War Games matches highlighting Survivor Series. The Ringer learned in an exclusive interview. Uh, We'll have a men's war games match and a women's war games match. The tradition of Survivor Series has embedded and flowed and changed slightly over time, but this will be similar to that. This will be, this will not be Raw versus SmackDown. It'll be much more storyline driven. First of all, let me just say, Ale effing Luya. Triple H brought back WCW's war games match during the time of NXT. Now that he's running the main roster, he's bringing it to Raw and SmackDown. (laughs) Vince McMahon, you can just feel, is just groaning at home or wherever he is. Um, so, but there's no matches yet. There's no matches. There's there, there's nothing official other than just the the the, the match types, and I think that it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, the war games. It, I like how we're getting rid of Raw and SmackDown. I think Triple H has realized that that gimmick don't make sense. It doesn't make sense because of so many reasons. Like you have people coming over from each brand every week with no explanation. You have uh, more than just that night where Raw and SmackDown go head to head. It happens on a weekly basis um, at WrestleMania at the rumble. I mean, the list goes on. So that makes sense. And there's nothing on the line anyway at all. So yeah, it's a, it's a great thing that war games will be 
in, incorporated here, and I'm interested to see what the storyline is, what's at stake. I'd imagine the Universal uh, WWE Undisputed Universal Championship is going to be involved in some way, but if it's Seth versus Roman, I mean, we'll see. I don't even want to speculate. That's two pay-per-views away. Uh, well, three pay-per-views away. My God, we still have, yeah. Was, so I don't even want to speculate at this point. There's too much to, to get to before then and too many things that could change, but it's a nice stipulation to have. I think it's it's going to be a lot of fun. So, um, all right. I think that is it, I believe. I think it was an, overall, I think it was a good episode of Monday Night Raw. Heel heat was the rule of the day. Uh, rule of the night, that is. I think it's something that I feel feel like people need to get used to. It's not always the baby faces overcoming. The baby faces overcoming is something that you want to see. So wouldn't you tune in until you see it? Uh, let's see. Seth Rollins and Lashley, I think, stole the night. Uh, we saw Lashley, or rather, uh, Austin Theory and Kevin Owens continue their feud. It was just a nice, fun night overall. And uh, we've got only got, what, three weeks? Less than three weeks now until the event in... Um, Extreme Extreme Rules in Philly. So, all right. That's it for me tonight, guys. I appreciate you listening. This is the end of the Monday Night Raw review, but don't worry. I'll be back tomorrow with the mailbag or probably Thursday. I work tomorrow. I'm not home. So when I'm home, I can get some extra stuff done, but I have to record my video podcast that I do every single Saturday night. It airs on the DuPont Now Network for free, by the way. You can go sign up at DuPontNow.com and watch me every Saturday at 8 p.m. But uh, that takes a lot of time to record and edit and send. It's a massive file, um, so it takes me time. So that usually will suck up my Wednesdays now. So it may be pushed to Thursday this week as it was last week with the mailbag. Um, but uh, continue to send you your questions and everything else. I think that uh, it'll give you some extra time if you are late in sending in your questions or voicemail or whatever you want to do. And then, uh, yeah, then that'll come out and then we'll be just into the regularly scheduled stuff with the NXT coverage tomorrow from Mark, Memphis Mark, and then the weekend review coming up this uh, this weekend. So everybody, thanks so much for listening. Please give us a five-star rating or review anywhere you can and consider to going ad-free on Patreon for a dollar a month. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Take care. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com and for all of these shows ad free head over to patreon.com slash wwe podcast until then we'll see you next time